I'm Michael Steinberg from the American Academy uh, in Berlin, and I'm delighted to be here uh, for many reasons, the interest and strength of the uh, panel and the conference uh, as a whole, uh, and also the uh, compatibility between uh, our institutions, meaning both Bard College Berlin and the CCF in Potsdam. Uh, I really applaud uh, these kinds of initiatives, and I'm very honored to have been asked to chair uh, the session. Uh, the uh, panel will consist of, uh, the formal part of the panel will consist of one paper and uh, two presenters. Uh, the two presenters are uh, uh, Martina Zweiner and uh, Giuseppe Shortino. Uh, they are also joined by by their son, Arjuna, uh, and because Arjuna is not quite ready for higher education, uh, his mother has elected to experience the first part of this panel in the back of the room, uh, but she is definitely here, and Arjuna may be here too, so I've assured both scholars that this is not a problem, uh, and I, if uh, he actually participates in the session, uh, he's three months old, uh, and I assume you will all agree this is, in a way, the new style of inclusivity and in higher education. Uh, since we have a little time, let me just take one or two minutes, not more than that, uh, before I formally introduce uh, the speakers uh, to tell you a little bit about the American Academy. Uh, it seems appropriate to do so, especially in this extremely dramatic position uh, that we're sitting in, in, in Berlin. Uh, the American Academy in Berlin was actually founded in the mid-1990s, just several years after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and its founder, Richard Holbrook, uh, who was an undersecretary Secretary of State, among other important positions, including uh, ambassador to Germany. Uh, Holbrook had the inspired idea uh, to replace the U.S. military presence in Germany with an intellectual presence, uh, and that the purpose and function of the American Academy, of an American Academy, would be to sustain internationalism, transatlantic dialogue, uh, and contact among the most creative minds uh, in three basic fields, and these continue continue to be the fields we emphasize, uh, political and economic policy, humanities and arts, uh, and especially ways and modes of scholarship and scholars who enjoy integrating these three fields. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say, uh, and don't quote me on this, uh, that, uh, the, that interdisciplinary study, uh, which is no longer new but uh, still needs originality, is, uh, is a kind of good American imperialism uh, as, as opposed to uh, other kinds. Uh, and that uh, U.S.-based scholars coming to Berlin uh, have a lot to offer and a lot to gain uh, from dialogues with uh, German and European scholars, especially in the current climate, uh, where we are all wondering on both sides of the Atlantic uh, exactly where the transatlantic dialogue uh, and the so-called post-war world or post-wall world uh, where we're all going. I don't think anybody has expertise on that. Uh, one thing we're all sure of is that uh, globalization has turned out to be very different from what we expected uh, and that questions of migration, immigration, and integration are way more important regionally, nationally, and globally uh, in Europe and in Germany and in the United States uh, than we would have predicted 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, for this reason, at the American Academy, we've actually, for the first time, designated a theme that we hope will last with us about three years, uh, and that theme uh, we're calling Migration and Integration, uh, where we hope to collaborate with various Berlin institutions, including uh, arts installations uh, and uh, civil society initiatives that have really shown a very powerful example in moving from the challenges of migration uh, to the challenges of uh, integration, uh, where political, cultural, aesthetic integration all play a role, but uh, somewhat differently uh, on, these various, on these various levels. Uh, so let me just invite you to uh, keep aware of our programs, uh, most of which are public, uh, and to come uh, out to Wannsee when the programs are there, uh, but also to our collaborative ventures in, in the city. Uh, so with that, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our two speakers. Let me just read you these short descriptions. Uh, Martina, uh, they're both sociologists. Uh, Martina Zweiner received a PhD in sociology and social research at the Universita di Trento.
Benevento and is teaching ethnographic methods and sociology at the Department of Psychology and Cognitive Science. She has just completed a 15-year ethnographic project with a group of women from the former USSR that she has followed from the very first days of their arrival in Italy to their relatively stable settlement. Her main research interests are migration studies, observational methods, and sexual behavior. And the reader of the paper, like me at the end of the alphabet, uh, Giuseppe Shortino received his PhD in sociology and social policy at the Università di Bologna and is teaching sociology at the Univers uh, Università di Trento. He has been a visiting professor at Haverford College, uh, Royal University of Phnom Penh. Uh, when I first read this, I, I, Haverford, I, I thought one of these places I know quite well. Uh, but the combination of Haverford and Phnom Penh uh, is, uh, I think, highly interesting in one uh, in my own provincial past, I have to say, I've never seen before. Uh, when we move on to Yale and Malmö, it becomes more sort of not typical, but less surprising. Uh, his main research interests are migration studies, cultural sociology, and social theory. He is director of SMMS, the Migration Research Center at the Department of Sociology of the University of Trent, and past chair of the Research Committee 16, Sociological Theory of the International Sociological Association. So with that, we turn to you, and you have, you have images, so I'm going to go down there. Well, thanks a lot for inviting us here, of course, and uh, I would like to start uh, seeing, remembering the fact that most of the stuff Martin and I have written in these years actually derives from our long friendship and collaboration with what we regard as one of the greatest German sociologists of migration, Michael Boms, before his untimely death. And we are pretty sure that if he were alive, this paper would have been much better, thanks to his comments. The purpose that we set for our paper, given the conference, is basically exploring the long-term changes in the European migration regime and trying to identify the sources of structural strain. Now, as a starting point, probably, is the fact that since we start working on migration, and that was many, many years ago, we never find a policy that worked. Or at least, we never find a policy that people think that worked. There are, I don't know if you realize, but I guess it's the, the experience like yours. Migration policies are always orphans. They never have father or mothers. The, the, the very same people who make migration policy start complaining about it immediately after the bill is passed in the house. Or otherwise, they justify saying, oh, well, you know, if I was constrained, force majeure, whatever and whatever. The field of migration policy is not done for making people happy. Not the migrant, unfortunately, but also the people who make policies and whatever. And this is something cross-cutting all the Western world. So, linking to the discussion with our Lebanese colleague, I would say this can be for two reasons. One reason is that the policy actually don't work. The other is that we have a way to add standards, to evaluate them. We want this policy to be feasible, achievable, fair, stable, and whatever. And we never wonder if we can really achieve all this stuff altogether at the same time, and given the constraint of a highly differentiated society in which several spheres works according to different logics. So what we would do is basically making a quick explanation of why, according to us at least, migration policy should have a more realistic standard to be evaluated, and second, apply this more realistic standard to the European migration regime. Now, every, we call somewhat liberal, because there is no a perfectly liberal state in the world, migration regime has to deal with pressures coming from the fact that there are different social spheres which have different logics. One, one is internal to a political system, which I will be very quickly, because probably you know, it's structured in a very strange way, according to other functional systems, because it's segmentally differentiated in territories. 
territory each one enjoys its own sovereignty, and which is supposed to be, even if the states are completely uneven in terms of power, wealth, geopolitical influence, and whatever, as they were supposed to be egalitarian. The idea of the United Nations Assembly, where anybody from the Vatican to the US has the same seat, a seat of the same sides, at least. But it's, they are also societies which have political systems, which are legitimized in terms of a community, no matter what this community is, and no matter how this community is conceived, but also by market economies, which works with the non-territorial principle of price. So that what is a migrant for a politician is not necessarily what is a migrant for an entrepreneur and vice versa. And third, which is the part which is, we think is more important to understand the European migration regime, our society defined by a structural strain between political decisions which are inevitably particularistic because they refer to a given sector of a given community, and a legal order which is increasingly self-perceived, self-defining itself in universalistic terms. Plus, in the case, specific case of immigration policy is the fact that migration policy as a field is very different from the field we are accustomed to study in social sciences like economic policy, monetary policies, internal affairs, even external affairs. For the reason that we briefly list here, first of all, there is no way in which you can make immigration policy together with your targets because your targets literally are not within the boundaries of the political system that make the decision, which means problem for the people who are outside, but also problem for the people who are inside, which don't have the adequate information and don't have the adequate check and balances that goes with, I don't know, trade unions bargaining. Second, there is no way in which you can give to statistical information the task of representing reality, because as you probably know, Migration statistics are very easy to challenge, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons, but still, it's very difficult to say uh, if we do see low, the GDP will grow 0.3, but it doesn't work with migration in the same way. Third, there are basically very few sanctions for people who, go, who challenge the policy networks, as waves after wave of populist parties have shown, you can easily use fake news, rumors, or whatever to challenge the policy field, and you generally win. And finally, this is something which was more studied in the US than in Europe, but it's true also in Europe, there are cross-cutting cleavages. People who would be traditionally on the left for certain reasons can be in favor of immigrants for certain reasons, and against immigrants for another reasons. People would be on the right, or vice versa. So there are lots of strange bedfellows, a strong, a lots of hybrid arguments. I think when I started studying immigration in the 90s, I would have never imagined that gay rights would become an anti-immigration argument and uh, stuff like that. So, let's move to Europe. Well, believe it or not, there is a European Day for Border Guards. Exist, there is a fair, it's a wonderful experience to go there and whatever. So what we would like to say is uh, the image of Fortress Europe, which is very popular. Half a million links on Google for if you put Fortress Europe. And it's even in the leaflet of our conference, <laughs> right? Is it a right icon for what we are living, for what we have been living in these 30 years? Or we should talk rather of a gentle monster, which is an expression that Hans Magnus and Sesberger coined for European Union that we think appropriated for also. He never talked about migration, but. We would go for the second, and we would explain for this reason. If we think the icon of the fortress, the idea that Europe is closing their borders to outside, moats, gates, whatever, how can we account for the stuff we list here, which are stuff that all of, body, all of us know, right? There are an astonishing number of short-term visa, Schengen short visa release around the world. We studied it in a paper with Claudia Finotelli. And uh, they are released even in countries which have a very long history of overstaying and visa abuse. Actually, some countries which are recorded as being among the strongest visa abusers have, been, have even got visa-free travel at a certain point along the process. 
So, I mean, it's a fortress which has gates pretty open, in a way. It's, uh, it's the area which receives more asylum requests from all over the world of the industrialized states. We know that most, most refugees live in developing countries, but of, of the industrialized countries, a high percent majority of the applications are filed in Europe, and again, doesn't really fit with the idea of Fortress Europe. The number of returned migrants, which the European Union recently year has finally started releasing, tells that only a very small fraction of the people who are identified as irregular on European territory are actually returning. Estimate varies because data are not high quality, but the most generous estimate would tell 40%, which means four out of 10, not even one out of two. Uh, we are working on calculating budgets and what the preliminary results say is that actually welfare investments on migrants in Europe is higher again than other OECD countries. And uh, finally, courts, the European courts, particularly in recent years, play quite a strong role in modifying migration policies. I should mention Irshi versus Ali, but there are tens or even more than a dozen court decisions which really change migration policy. So it's not really a fortress. So at least the idea of fortress is very popular. It has a clear political usefulness in promoting human activism, humanitarian activism in favor of migrants, but doesn't really fit with the valuable evidence. We did something better. And that's what we would suggest, which actually is, uh, let's say, let's ma make me a preliminary methodological statement. As a social scientist, we have to take the native point of view, right? Okay, even politicians are native. And when I try to reconstruct what a gentle monster is, of course I'm not judging if it's good or bad, I'm just trying to see how people, to, you talk to from the European Commission to local council in small towns, usually tells about it. And basically, the paradoxical expression which makes talk of a gentle monster is that there is clearly a strong restrictionist attitude which tries to curb migration flows to Europe, particularly if they are coming from refugees and asylum seekers. Visa policy is perfectly matched. All the countries which produce refugees have stricter visa policies than countries that don't produce refugees, as an example. But on the other side, these factual restrictionist policies are predicated upon the intention of fully respecting the Geneva Convention and actually fully respecting the non refoulement clause of the Geneva Convention. It's, uh, I thought I want to mention, but somebody mentioned Tampere this morning. If you have read the, the old document of Tampere, what is striking, it, it starts saying, in order to fully realize the Geneva Convention respecting our refoulement clause, we need to do this and this, and after follows restrictive measures. It may sound hypocritical, but actually is probably the logic that really explains that. And in order to explain why we believe this realistic, which is not means right, means only realistic, we need to go to the history of the gentle monster. How the gentle monster was born. Now, I heard yesterday and today, and probably we, we, I said also many times that, of course, the new migration regime was born out of the fall of the Berlin Wall and whatever. It wouldn't be polite, given the context, saying that the Berlin Wall didn't matter. Of course, it mattered. It mattered a lot. But it's not the only possible explanation. It's an older story, which starts much earlier than the fall of the Berlin Wall. It starts earlier than when the, the very same idea that the Berlin Wall could fall was, um, you probably recognize the two pictures, and I think the story starts there. The picture above is Armando Rodriguez de Sa, the 10th September of 1964, the one millionth guest worker in uh, Germany, which is celebrated. They gave him a bike, uh, uh, flowers, it's a bit weird because he had traveled for three days in train with no sleeping, so he doesn't look particularly happy of that. But uh, that's the idea. And there is a band playing in the station and stuff like that. 
the picture below, as you probably recognize, because it's much more famous, is the first group of DDR people that through Hungary, because also that crisis started through Hungary, arrives and gets their newly German passports. In the period in between these two pictures is the moment in which uh, you have to consider the birth of the gentle monster. Why? Because before 73, as you probably remember, most refugees would actually come to Europe as guest work. Cards, refugee, which today would be classified as cards, would not classify as cards, but would enter as gastarbeid. It's only when recruitment programs stop in 1973 and a few years later that we notice a starting increasing in pressure on the refugee regime. It's not because they were workers before and they are fake refugees afterward. It's just because people try to use the categories which fit better the migration plan and migrating as laborer usually is easier than migrating as a refugee. It doesn't expose you to blackmail at home, your kids are fine, whatever. The second and more important part is the refugee until the early 80s are people that Europeans can understand. Either they're left or they're right. Either they're Christian or they're socialist. They're people who are escaping from right-wing dictatorship in Latin America, so the left loves them, or other people who are escaping from Indochina, the communist Indochina, so the right, or also the moderate left loves them. From the 80s, this clear, straightforward identification of European cleavages with refugee players modifies, and we will see why. And finally, remember, until the 80s, Southern European states provides an ample reservoir of cheap labor for northern European states, which enjoy freedom of movement, cutting the grass under the feet of irregular migration system. But this ends also in the, seven, in the 80s. And uh, this is pretty much Berlin, and I would insist on Berlin, because it's where the first migration crisis of the new gentle monster starts. 1986, a boat in Newfoundland, Canada, is found with 155 Tamils refugees, which are escaping from using Germany as a transit point. It's a, I didn't remember until I came across the story and I went reading the newspaper, it was big news, front page of the New York Times and stuff like that. And uh, it brought me to the archive to work on what's happened in the early 80s. And basically in the early 80s what happens is that through Berlin, lots of migrants start arriving in, and they are not really fitting anymore with political European cleavages. Who are the Tamil? Why are they fighting for? Why are they escaping? What do they want? Or whatever. And uh, the number grows. It, doesn't, it seems small now, but if you look at the delta of increase, the delta of increase was staggering at the time. And what is more important is that when Germany tries to stop the flow, putting visa requirements on Sri Lanka, the DDR, which still exists on the other side, start basically putting advertisement on Sri Lanka newspapers saying, you know what, you can fly to the DDR, cross to Berlin where there is no checkpoint for people going to Berlin and apply for asylums in the West. You get money, art currency for your airline companies and you get of course political pressures against the the, 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 actually, the solution is, after a few years, in, I think 86, is basically giving lots of money to the DDR in order for them to put visa requirement to Sri Lanka. That reminds you of something? Yes. And um, second part, the second point, it's the moment in which non-refoulement becomes much more important for the European political scene because it becomes a point in which once you are in, it's very difficult to kick you out, no matter if you are qualified or not, because the non-refoulement clause that I remember, Professor Gaskell probably knows better than I do, but when it was introduced was not so important as it became in the 80s, at least in the popular perception of what the Geneva Convention was, become, is, has become now the main ground of staying for most of the refugees in Europe. And so, the gentle monster is born. From one side, oh yeah, are the Tampere conclusions. 
why the European Union feels the need to start a document reaffirming their commitment to a document that they have already signed. The reason is the alternative, which was already discussed in political circles all over Europe, was changing the Geneva Convention. It's, not, it's an old story, the fact that the Geneva Convention doesn't fit anymore with the time, and the alternative was, at the time, mostly right-wing people were responding is, there is a new kind of refugees, we need to change the Geneva Convention. So the statement which justified the gentle monster is, we will be tougher on factual entries as an exchange for keeping intact the principle of the Geneva Convention. And that's the reason for which, I guess, they feel the need to state in the beginning that that's their main commitment. But on the other side, we discourage the use of the rights that we keep intact. Highly selective visa policies, strengthening of border control, introduction to career sanction, sanctions against smuggling, which means usually sanction against irregular migration because most irregular migration needs smuggling. A growing significance of the principle of the first safe country and whatever. Uh, to be quick, the key precondition of all this measure is that you have a neighboring state which helps you prevent unwanted flows. It's not written in the documents, except in one document, the 1998 document of the Austrian presidencies, which was vilified because it tells the truth. The only way we can stop migrants is having a circle of neighboring states, possibly not too much liberal neighboring states, which filters the migrants for us. It worked, as you probably remember. That's the trends of asylum applications in the OECD, the EU, and Germany. And you see that while the trend is pretty much the same, telling you that flows are justified by geopolitical emergencies and not only by political opening, still the peak of 1991 sharply decreased with the introduction of the gentle monster. What are the consequences of the introduction of a gentle monster? Why? Because we think that migration regime modify migration at least as much as migration modify migration regime. There are external consequences, meaning changes in the way in which migrants behave, anticipating European policies, which means that likely that's our estimate, and it's a very kind of tentative reasoning, but let's say, Comparing reliable literature, we would say that probably from 2001, 2002, the number of irregular migrants in Europe decreased. There, but there are more circular, seasonal, or semi, what is called semi-compliance, people having a tourist visa but working or vice versa. Except that usually long-term migrants were coming from south while Circular migrants usually come from east, and that's also a change. But there is also a growing strata of migrants in orbit in neighboring states. There has been research done pretty much all over from Istanbul to Morocco, saying that there are people who, just, who arrive there who have no interest and no real intention to go back anyway, because they spent already money, because they lost status, because they would risk to be classified as a failure in their own communities for many, many reasons, which grows year after year. And there is, within Europe, a growing number of migrants who cannot be retired because, for pra many practical reasons, we can go into the question, but at the same time cannot be legalized. It's a kind of ultra-irregular migrants, which was a very rare phenomenon until the end of the 90s, and has become quite sizable now. Internally, meaning internal uh, the regime, there is the fact that the tension between European states increase enormously in the last 10 years, and particularly in the year from 2012 on. Why do we think that the tension increased? For a very simple reason. Schengen and Dublin agreement are beggar your neighbor policies, more or less. They basically say there is a common function, which is border control, or asylum management, and this, the whole responsibility for this falls on states which have external borders, which of course are not the states and are not even the states migrants want to go to, right? 
So the costs of border control, which are sizable, the, co the, the costs of rescue missions, which are even more sizable, and of course the cost of refugee receptions, would, if the policies were applied in full, full entirely either on Eastern Europe, on the new member states, on the Southern Rim. People don't care very much until the number of migrants there start growing. Because remember, Italy, Greece, Spain didn't used to have refugees. They had lots of migrant workers, but not refugees. Refugees at most were transit people who would move. But when you start fingerprinting them and Eurodac starts operating less than 10 years ago, effectively, meaning in a way that can effectively recognize fingerprints, these people can be retarded, the famous Dubliners, whose number increase. Plus, the visa policy become more and more effective, which means that the only way to get in the Union, if you want to file an asylum application, is basically crossing a border. And crossing a border means crossing an external border, and crossing an external border brings you there. Now, Okay. This has the 2015 crisis has been solved, right? Well, and uh, I couldn't find the picture. Actually, if some of the German historian can find me a picture of the Onecker call agreement on stuff, I would love because it, unfortunately I had to use the New York Times because I couldn't find the picture. But it's precisely the same idea. It's a bit more elaborated in the case of Merkel-Erdogan agreement because there is a kind of exchange of people and whatever, but still the idea is the same. We decentralize control to neighboring country, and as long as neighboring country see a good sides of the bargain, the problem is solved, and actually, numerically speaking, it's solved. The problem is that Libya doesn't seem to be effective on this regard. And to conclude, because I think I'm beyond my 20 minutes, Okay, you may wonder why I put this nice picture here, because according to the internet, I don't know if it's a fake news or not, that woman is the daughter of one of the original Tamil asylum seekers in Germany, and the guy apparently is some kind of German TV rich guy, golden boy. <laughs> so I thought it was a nice success story, at least always in order to plan. And, the picture, and also, I like weddings, usually. But the other stuff on the other side is, what the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees wrote about the original Tamil agreement in 1986. And I'm pretty sure that if I would cancel the last two lines and put 2017, you would not find anything strange in reading this statement, isn't it? So, somewhat, there is a new European migration regime. This European migration regime has a long history by now and uh, are still the same structural tensions going on at this core. That's all. Ja, herzlichen Dank nochmal für diesen historischen Rückblick. Um, um, many thanks for this historical and genealogical uh, uh, look back. I would like to, I'm, I don't know actually, should I speak in German or English, so um, I, I will mix. I would like you to say some more words on the early 2000s, because as you were hinting at, that was, I think, uh, it, was a main, it was a main period where it was not... Um, wo es noch nicht ausgemacht war, welches Regime das europäische Migrations- und Grenzregime ähm, dominieren wird. Okay, sorry. 
So I think in the, in the early 2000s, it was a period where, where it was not decided yet which kind of regime was dominating the European migration and border regime. So as you were hinting at, there was a kind of labor migration still going on and a regime of a temporal and, um, and, and legalization practice by the Southern European countries. And that was, in a way, the time when, for the Southern European countries, it was they were not bothering with the huge waves of migration at that time, because, in a way, they were legalizing them, the illegal, the irregular migrants from every, you know, three, four years. And on the other hand, there was this transit going on. And, and I think it stopped when Sarkozy and Merkel, and it was Sarkozy and Merkel at that time, uh, were, were trying to, to, you know, to place the asylum regime in the middle of the European migration and border regime. It was, uh, uh, you, I think it was, uh, the deal at that time was called Euro-Mediterranean Pact, for bidding or telling the South and European countries that they should stop with this legalization practice and putting asylum and with it the Dublin regime in the middle of, of, of the European policies. And that was the main break and the main paradigm shift, I would say. And with it, the, the North-South divide came and the North-South question was put in the middle of the debate. I would like if you could say some, more, some words how you see this kind of um, analysis. Uh, I would agree in part. I, I think that refugee control has always been the main drive behind the new European border regime since '86. But it's true that the first 2000s were completely different for two reasons. Well, remember, at the Tampere time, Europe was a center-left continent. There were all leftist governments in place. And so Tampere was more ambiguous than ever because it was clearly committed to a liberal regime, clearly committed to migration control, but also clearly committed to some kind of universalistic order, which at the end didn't last very much. The second is that uh, once is you make policy, once is you make the instruments that make policies. All the policies which were developed in the last, at the end of the 90s took more than, many more years than expected to operate, from Eurodac to, to the same Schengen information system and whatever. It turned out to be much more complex. It turned out to rely on much more, com more complex operation. Like if you people don't take fingerprints, then Eurodac is useless and whatever and whatever. If you take fingerprints in a certain way, Eurodac cannot identify them and whatever. So the system changed also because it was a waiting time. Every year the Commission was releasing this report saying, okay, we will do it right next year and whatever and whatever. So there is a kind of practice-based problem in those years which explains also because the problem started much later than expected. Yeah, that's uh, what I was uh, about actually to add. Uh, I mean, mo most of our work is being based on the research that we have done uh, with former USSR migrants starting, uh, we started early in the 2000, uh, basically and we did a very lengthy ethnography with them and actually most of the people that we worked with uh, came uh, as irregular uh, migrants. Uh, if I look back at the time when we started that research and I compare it with nowadays, of course the situation has changed a lot, that flow stabi stabilized and we clearly do not see uh, any more uh, irregular migrants like we saw in the 2000s. So I would completely agree uh, with him that it took time for policies to kind of settle down, yeah. Okay, may I? Thank you very much for the, the information and the very good lecture. I would like to know if you asked uh, the, uh, the people about the satisfaction here in Europe and in the other countries because uh, as I understand the gentle monster uh, could be a very different culture 
for the refuse from Syria and Libya and so on. And uh, I know someone who said we were happier there in Turkey because here we receive everything, but I don't feel myself uh, really happy. Did you ask uh, what, what do you can say about uh, the way uh, the, they are feeling their self in Europe? I think that's work for Germans to do. I mean, in Italy it wouldn't really work because there is not so much step. Oh, first, we don't give so much stuff to refugees anyway, and second, they don't stay long enough. <laughs> so I would be happy to read the German paper. On, there is surely a phenomenon of refugee return, sometimes not only because you are forced, but because you want to return or you want to move to a third country. I don't think it's been studied a lot. So there are lots of students here. That would be a good paper. Um, thank you. Um, you talked about the um, gentle monster and the fortress of Europe as uh, two terms which can be criticized a lot. And I agree with that. So I would like to ask you for um, your opinion on another term that was introduced by um, Hank van Hotem and Rose Pipes, which is called the European Union as a gated community. So that would say there are legal ways to come to Europe, but they are very selective based on sometimes or often economical criteria or the criteria um, of a special nationality. Um, and the gentle monster is, I think, um, Enzensberger invented this term concerning the um, bureaucratic um, establishment of this huge European Union. Um, so um, I would like to know what you think about the term of the gated community. Community is, is clearly an idea of inclusion based on wealth, right? You live in a gated community and people who come in are, must be rich as you, or at least must be. While the gentle monster, of course we are forcing Enzensberger terms quite a lot, but it's the idea of an enormous bureaucratic monster which is restrictive, like any bureaucratic monster has to be, but at the same wants to be good, not only rich, but also good. Yeah. And that's probably reflected temporary spirits more than anything else. While in the gate community, you don't need to be good. Usually, you don't want to be good if you're there, right? I don't know. I never think about it. Can I make a comment? Yeah, please. I, I want to steal my, or my, my, my right to make a comment. I, I, I don't know the use of the term gated community in this context, which I think is very interesting, but in a kind of uh, vernacular uh, American context, I think the gated community is more complex than wealth. I think it also stands for behavior, uh, which is very often a kind of cover or euphemism for ethnicity and race and sexuality, etc. Uh, this brings me back to your, um, your attention between rights and taboo. Uh, halfway through your presentation, so I wonder if that's a, a, something that this metaphor helps to uh, helps to complicate in this context. Yes, so I, I would agree. I think that uh, probably if we plug in uh, race and ethnicity, uh, this complicates the metaphor that we used. And but I don't know if I would go as far as a gated community. I personally don't like it. Uh, I've, I've spent time in the US and I, I think it's a very, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't go as far as using maybe that metaphor. But I would agree though with you that maybe we should possibly complicate it a little bit more by plugging in the other two variables, yeah. These are done without uh, migrants uh, because they're outside, uh, whatever type of migrants, refugees, illegal migrants, um, uh, uh, illegal guest workers, and so on and so forth. But you have done your, your um, uh, research. 
um, on uh, people who moved in from the USSR. Um, in how far do you see that this type of research, not only yours but others as well, can influence uh, po policies that will be upcoming? Because I do think we are always in a state of flux, not only in terms of migration but also the reaction to migration. Um, so in how far do you see that these types of academic studies uh, can influence and strengthen the voice of migrants uh, um, in terms of this discussion? Thank you. If I can... Uh, probably if uh, academic research was widely read, uh, we might fantasize about some uh, positive influence, but I actually don't think or have not experienced, let's put it in these milder terms, have not experienced the fact that uh, uh, somehow our research can um, have uh, any kind of outcome on policies. Uh, that's, uh, I don't know how to put it mildly than this, but at least that's our experience. I mean, the, the, in terms of research experience, uh, we have, uh, one thing is to uh, kind of observe what goes on on the field, and the other thing is then to kind of communicate it to policy uh, makers. It's, I think it's kind of two different, uh, unfortunately, worlds and different languages. Oh, oh, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But I wouldn't know how to fill it in. Uh, so so I say, st we stay on the other side, the academic one. Yeah. So I, I've been asked to recommend that everybody mo move to the exhibition uh, and that uh, we will reconvene at 2.15. And in the meantime, thanks to all three presenters. All right.